Thank you. Cynthia asked me if I would tell you that Becky Ann's next, and I will with a little story. Um, well, two. First time I heard Becky Ann read, I thought, oh my gosh, what just happened to me? Because her images are that strong. There was a time when Becky Ann came and she was troubled that the students in her class were too kind that their work was not improving because they were only giving each other compliments. So we talked about ways that they could be more analytical, ways that they could push each other creatively. And then she came back after class, flattened herself against the wall and said, oh my God, I turned them into a tank of bleeping barracudas. <laughs> you can fill in the bleep. I'm gonna read one poem long, so think of it as a really short, short story where nothing happens. <laughs> it's called Rooms by the Beach. Sometimes when I look up at the stars, I forget everything I know. The world is neither happy nor unhappy. Early summer, night warm as skin, and on the mountain slope, one house is lit up for a party. The huff of a car door, the trebles of laughter, drift down to the private darkness, the desert all scratch and shadow. The guests must be beautiful and rich. Above them hang the stars of the great bear, glittering eagerly. I'd come outside to look at the sky during a party once. People stood with their cocktails around the pool with its underwater light opening its large blue eye. A man and I made small talk. What he did, what I did, who we knew. When he heard I knew Marie, he told me he'd been wanting to meet her. But she was, he said, so beautiful and around beautiful women, he got tongue-tied. And then he asked if I would introduce him. I looked at him hard. Tonight, looking at the windows of the house up there, each the same gold bleed, gold that bleeds off into the black of all form, I tried to think when had something or someone beautiful rendered me speechless, heart in my throat. Though I have been silent enough now, in the middle of some magnificent dream, the trill of desert toads waiting for water in the arroyo, the tiny gecko crawling the cement stoop, the delicate tick of dry seed pods falling from the old Palo Verde, somewhere not to have to be. The haze of a few monsoon clouds slides past the low half moon. But back at the party, Marie was chatting with a couple in the corner. I hadn't known that she was beautiful. Her short brown hair, wide face, small flat lips, her figure full and beginning to go to fat. She did have pretty eyes, dark as coffee, and a nice smile. I wasn't being bitchy. And the man I had been talking with was just another lawyer writing a novel. Though there was a waiter at the Cuban restaurant who was more gorgeous than any man had the right to be, had dark eyes a woman could fall into, a form so fine she dreamed herself against him and forgave the wilted salad or the tardy glass of wine. And still, I could articulate the fact the fish was underdone. And when he tried to tell me it was cooked correctly, leaning over and smiling, and yes, beautiful ladies, wild horse beautiful, I smiled back and said, the flesh should not be translucent. Showed him with my fork. His hair was chestnut in the light. And for half a second, the cherry wood gleaming in a room of my childhood. Then I was back 
watching him disappear with the fish into the steamy kitchen like a mirage, like the white half moon behind the boulders balanced on the southern ridge this evening, the ghosts of headlights from the mountain road swinging out to the middle of nothing. All we are is light. We are traveling always, each a radiating body, losing itself in its beholding and in its long desire already a past. It's in our DNA, the lonesome glitter of our cells emitting photons. We are never in one place. Tonight, I'm at the party. Tonight, I'm standing in the dark behind my house where the desert starts to rise to the mountain, the air humid, humid, scented with resin. No rain in five months. Two mule deer stood not far from here earlier, down among the houses, looking for water, a young buck whose antlers were beginning to bud, another older who stared at me a long time. I was perfectly still. It seemed to me I could feel his gaze and my own strangeness while the young one chewed leaves from the mesquite. I could feel his gaze and my changing because of it and my loneliness because of it and my dying and my beauty. Tonight I'm in the dimness of the parking lot behind the restaurant the waiter smoking with his back leaned against the dumpster half in shadow. His face looked more brutal then, handsome, but brutal, like he could love you and still slit your throat. Then he smiled. I don't remember how we got to talking. He was from Modesto, came here after a woman, but he said, it didn't work out. He still pulled her picture from his wallet and held it up under the light so I could see. There was the face of a woman I'd never met and never would. Her eyes light blue like rooms by the beach. Some things you remember too clearly and you have no idea why they come to you on a June night under the stars watching the house on the slope glow like a small hope in the black air. From there they must see the city spilled out, twinkling below. From here I can look back on my own window, holding the chair and the desk as I left them. I am always imagining the world where I am dead, telling myself this is how it will look. It will look like her eyes, the waiter's woman, an empty bed, a cotton shirt draped on a chair, everything a reflection. Who knows if what the eye sees is what the mind sees, much less the heart, if you call it that, that place in us that aches when we love. Everywhere we look in the night sky, a world is burning, a world of then, a world of now, a world of never and ever, a world of Marie, turning in her violet dress near the table with the coffee urn, silver earrings sending a spark. Like I said, that night when he asked me to approach her, I looked at him hard, pretty sure I was going to tell him to go fuck himself. <laughs> He was a man, a little heavy, going bald, a sloped and shining forehead, thick nose, a man whom probably no beautiful woman would ever talk to, a man so fearful of beauty it struck him dumb. Then I took him gently by the arm, led him across the patio, past the potted palms, past the cluster of women with wine, past the Mexican mask hung near the sliding glass door to where she was standing and introduced him. She smiled as he cleared his throat, swallowed a couple times, and stammered it was nice to meet her. He didn't notice when I let go of his arm 
and slipped away. Once, as I was leaving, I looked back and glimpsed him through the happy windows of that house, which seemed to hold a world far away and going beautifully without me, as it must tonight up there on the slope. And further out, where so many stars are, I lose my head. I love everyone, even the waiter, who was still bent over her eyes when I said goodnight, as if, if he looked long enough, she'd appear. Lately, everywhere I go, someone is wounded or about to be. Everywhere, someone has left, been left behind or left someone or loved someone who never came. It is easy to believe the stars no more than we do, seeing us always in their past. The animals have gone back to the mountain. The house on the mountain has gone dark. Still we see, as we see in dreams, hunched in our own light, that just this afternoon, two deer passed through. Look long, the night is warm. Golden Arcturus is pulsing, and the faint smell of monsoon two days off is almost sweet. Someone has left us here and slipped away. The darkness is rich tonight. Its guests are beautiful. How can we not speak? <laughs>